Item number SCP-1760 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All instances of SCP-1760 are to be contained within Site-84. The surrounding four square kilometers are to be enclosed within a chain-link fence topped with barbed wire. Citizens are to be dissuaded with a cover story of archaeological research. During manifestation, all instances of SCP-1760 are to be opened and the contents catalogued. SCP-1760 are then to be refitted with tracking beacons and resealed prior to the end of the manifestation. Due to the results of the November 15, 2006 opening of SCP-1760-16 and the subject's increasingly hazardous contents, this particular instance of SCP-1760 is to remain sealed at all times upon manifestation. See Incident 1760-1 Description SCP-1760-1-15 are a series of 15 black pine coffins that annually rise from the ground at noon on November 15 in a wooded area outside Minsk, Belarus. Each coffin bears a white orthodox cross. No other identifying marks are visible. Upon rising from the ground, SCP-1760-1-15 are always sealed and contain a full set of human remains that vary with each manifestation. These remains are always Caucasian and dressed in regional funeral attire. Autopsies have shown that these remains are always newly embalmed upon manifestation. At midnight on November 20th, each instance of SCP-1760 sinks into the ground, regardless of whether or not it has been disturbed. Excavation attempts to locate SCP-1760 upon submersion have shown that the subject stops three meters below the surface during the remainder of the year. Instances that have been reopened after sinking have been found completely empty of contents. Removing an instance from the site prevents submersion, but causes the subject to be replaced at the next manifestation by an identical coffin. At this point, the initial instance loses its anomalous properties. These replacements appear to originate from further beneath the site. Excavation attempts to locate this point of origin have so far been met with failure. Bodies that remain outside SCP-1760 after November 20 rapidly decay within three hours of the end of the manifestation. The extent of this decay varies with the subject, and can range from light decomposition to the subject disintegrating into ash. Remains that appear within SCP-1760 have been successfully tracked after the end of a manifestation through the use of tracking beacons. Upon recovery, these beacons have been found buried in caskets, sealed within crypts, and increasingly within crematory urns, all within Belarusian borders. Remains recovered in this manner lack any of the observed clothing or embalmment seen during the SCP-1760 manifestation. It is currently unknown how SCP-1760 gains access to, reconstitutes, or redresses a body prior to manifestation. Every six years, only one instance of SCP-1760 rises on November 15, save for the name Pyotr carved into the lid. This coffin is identical to the other instances and has been given the designation SCP-1760-16. The past contents of this instance have ranged from packed earth to animated remains. Attempts to trace the origin of these contents have been met with failure, as tracking beacons cease to function following SCP-1760-16's complete submersion. Investigation to the identity of Pieter has revealed that the subject was a Minsk mortician and scientist involved in several Soviet projects in the 1950s. Recovered records indicate the subject passed away on November 15, 1959. A majority of the records of research were destroyed by GRU Division P operatives prior to 1960. Anecdotal evidence suggests experimentation with long-term chemical preservation of human remains, as well as chemically induced reanimation and regeneration. The identities of any other scientists involved on the projects are also unknown, as such names were expunged from existing records. Exhumation of Pieter 
by research staff has confirmed no anomalous properties with either the remains or burial site. According to recovered GRUP records, SCP-1760 was first discovered in 1961, following local reports of a casket garden being opened outside of Minsk. Upon initial containment, a plaque was discovered at the site with the following message. Let us gather here today to honor the lives and memories of our dearly departed, such that they are given immortality upon this earth. SCP-1760 was first contained by Foundation personnel in 1992, following the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Addendum 1760-A The contents of SCP-1760-16 from 1964 to 1988 were recovered from GRUP logs. From 1994 onward, all SCP-1760-16 manifestations occurred in Foundation containment. November 15, 1964 SCP-1760-16 was filled to capacity with packed earth. Samples matched the soil qualities of a coniferous forest. November 15, 1970 SCP-1760-16 was filled to capacity with teeth. Tests confirmed that the teeth were from a mixture from human, canine, feline, and ophidian sources. November 15, 1976 SCP-1760-16 was filled to capacity with blood. Tests confirmed the blood to be human of mixed blood types. November 15, 1982 17 bird carcasses Test on the captured specimen identified a species of Corvus cornix, hooded crow. Upon opening the casket, the specimens reanimated and attempted to fly away. November 15, 1988 One headless animal carcass. Test identified the species as a Cervus elephus, red deer. Upon opening of the casket, the carcass began to move and attempted to flee the area. November 15, 1994 one complete set of human remains similar to those found in normal SCP-1760 instances. Upon opening the casket, the subject began to move and attempted to attack personnel, but was destroyed by Agent prior to incident. November 15, 2000 62 human hands of various size and levels of decomposition. Upon opening the casket, the hands reanimated and attempted to swarm researcher but were contained prior to any injury. November 15, 2006 See Incident 1760-1 November 15, 2012 See Incident 1760-2 Addendum 1760-B Incident 1760-1 On November 15, 2006, at 14.30, researchers and reported the sound of heavy breathing coming from inside SCP-1760-16 prior to opening. The researchers waited for agents and to arrive for additional security before proceeding. Upon opening the casket, an animal carcass burst out, knocking agent to the ground. The subject then immediately exploded, releasing a large amount of bone matter that acted as shrapnel. The explosion caused casualties. Upon testing, the carcass was identified as Suscrofa domesticus, domestic pig, whereas the bone fragments released in the explosion proved to be human. The source of the explosion has yet to be identified. Incident 1760-2 The air was still as snow fell upon a forest clearing outside of Minsk. Here and there a few dead tufts of grass would appear above the powder but otherwise the blanket of snow was pristine. At the center was a single, black pine coffin with a white orthodox cross adorning its lid. By the clearing's edge stood two men and one woman. Each turned to the others in silence before one, a tall man with a chin coated with a thick layer of stubble, nodded for them to continue. They were Researcher Lee, Researcher Hastings, and Agent Navarro. The date was November 15, 2012. SCP-1760-16 had returned. Normally, 1760-16 was identical to other 1760 instances, 
save for the name Pyotr Astapinov etched onto the lid. This year, however, twelve additional names were present. Each one belonged to a prominent anarchist of the Foundation's watchlist. It was for this reason Agent Navarro, an art specialist, now found himself in Belarus. As they approached the casket, a loud scratching sound could be heard. They stopped moving and watched as a single name appeared etched onto the lid below the others. Daniel Navarro. That's really unsettling, researcher Lee commented as she eyed Navarro. Her feet refused to carry her closer. This is the first time one of the instances has been externally altered. I don't like this at all. Researcher Hastings also kept his distance. What do you think, Navarro? Keep to the plan, Navarro replied. We're safe if we don't open the box. He coolly gestured for the researchers to proceed. Without another word, the two researchers went to work. With the same level of care one might use to clean a glass figurine, they measured, listened, and recorded. Navarro stood at the ready, hand on his pistol as he looked for Calamity to strike. As the researchers worked, the casket remained silent. Eventually, all requested data had been collected. 1760-16 had failed to produce little more than a creek the entire time. The researchers and agents stepped back and looked upon the coffin quizzically. This is it? Lee's chuckle faded into a frown. Just names engraved onto the lid? It would appear so, Hastings nervously giggled. I guess we just wait for the twentieth now. Navarro nodded in agreement. One by one, each made their way back to the nearby facility. Before heading through the door, Agent Navarro gave one last look back at the coffin. His eyes glanced over the white cross that adorned its lid. He felt the coffin staring back. Navarro quietly shivered and turned away, closing the door behind him. The next four days came and went without incident. Unfortunately, this made the site personnel more and more uneasy the closer November 20th came. The night of the 19th was by far the worst. Few in the facility could sleep. The rest were fixated on the Sword of Damocles sitting in the front yard. This is how Agent Navarro found himself walking towards the clearing at 11.15 pm. The thick trees appeared to twist around him in the dark as he slowly crept through the snow. As he approached the clearing's edge, three security officers emerged from the trees. Their hands tightly gripped their guns as they moved to intercept the intruder. Upon seeing it was Navarro, the agents frowned but waved him through with a nod. For a few moments, Navarro stood motionless at the edge of the clearing. The moonlight illuminated the snow and cast a white glow on the waiting coffin. By its side, Navarro could make out the silhouette of a woman. He could feel his hand reach for his pistol as he approached, but relaxed after seeing that it was just Researcher Lee. Couldn't sleep? he asked. What? What are you doing out here? Researcher Lee, gasping, turning on the spot. I could ask you the same thing, Navarro replied with a small smile. This thing really has everyone on edge, doesn't it? You can't blame them. Lee turned back to face the coffin as she whispered. She was there in 2006. She remembered how a pig carcass erupted from 1760-16 and exploded in a shower of human bones. One of her colleagues' head had been pierced by half a femur. A piece of rib had left a deep gash in her right thigh. They remained silent for several minutes before Navarro placed a hand on her shoulder. Lee shivered. You can't help but feel the shit is going to hit the fan in the next few seconds. Even if they brought a specialist out to ensure all goes well. Lee nervously smiled. No offense. None taken, Navarro said with a shrug. To be honest, I'm not sure what they exactly thought I could do out here. Normally I'm assigned to deal with Anarch threats, but this object really didn't give me that Anarch feel when I read its file. Well, it was on display when we found it, Lee replied. Someone wanted others to see their work. Maybe. I mean, it does have a hey-look-at-this-cool-thing quality to it, but pig bombs? The 1760-16s didn't appear until after we started containing the site, though. Lee looked at her watch. It was now 11.30 p.m. 
1760-16 would be gone in 30 minutes. I can stay and watch if you want to head back and try to get some sleep, Navarro said with a smile. Without a word, she returned his smile with a nod. Lee then began to make her way back towards the facility. Navarro turned back to the casket. He waved to the several nearby security cameras before taking a seat on the grass as he waited alone. Fifteen minutes passed. The silence was unbreakable. Hello, Daniel. A male voice whispered from the coffin. Shit! Navarro jumped to his feet. A shard of ice ran up his spine as he drew his pistol. The security officer were quick to run to his side, but stopped when Navarro held up his hand for them to stand down. Frightened, are we? The voice softly chuckled. It spoke English, but had a very thick Eastern European accent. Hello there, I guess. Navarro's eyes narrowed as he held his gun steady. Who the hell are you? In a prior life, I was known as Pyotr Astapinov. I was a skilled mortician, a respected scientist, and a gentleman. If you would be so kind as to open the lid, you may see for yourself, the voice whispered. There is no way in hell that's going to happen, Navarro replied. There was nothing anomalous about Pyotr when we poked around his grave. You've got a huge hole in your story, pal. I was afraid you might say that, the voice sighed. They've really changed you. Your curiosity has been replaced with certainty. What a shame. You sure know a lot about me considering we just met, Navarro said. Because I know your breed, the voice whispered. You're an artist. They may have you dress in a suit, hand you a gun, and ask you to apprehend your brethren, Daniel. But you are still an artist at heart. One with a heavily compromised sense of morality, mind you, but an artist all the same. I don't understand, said Navarro. Where on earth are you going with this? My point is that you don't want to open this casket to catalog it like a scientist. You recognize the importance not only in expression, but expression in a matter that is truly unique. I've met plenty of men like you, and can guess that it's torturing you to not know what's inside this coffin. The security officer looked at Navarro nervously. All seemed to hold their breath waiting for Navarro's response. I've got a pretty good idea of what's in your box, Navarro replied. Sorry, champ, but I'm not opening it. So sure of yourself yet again, the voice said. Are you afraid that I'm just some horror waiting to be let out of my cage? Or that I might just be Pieter after all? Fuck it. I'm not going to play this game with you. Navarro shook his head. What I do saves the lives of both anarchists and civilians. If that makes me a sellout, so be it. I'll be the biggest sellout ever. Without another word, he took a few steps back and looked at his watch. 11.55 PM So be it, the voice said. There was a crack like a shotgun blast. All of the nails that kept the coffin lid sealed flew out of the wood. Navarro and the security officers readied their weapons. Their eyes widened as the coffin lid creaked open. It was empty. It must truly be troubling to have sold your soul as you have, Daniel. Regardless of what you say to yourself to allow you to sleep at night, you have sold your soul. It is a shame. You had such promise. The voice called from inside. Navarro didn't respond. The last few moments passed in silence. Upon the stroke of midnight, the casket began to sink into the earth eventually vanishing into the ground. Christ! Navarro let out a heavy sigh, and sat back down on the ground to gaze at the sky. The report for this was going to be a nightmare. Agent Navarro stood quietly over the grave of Pyotr Astapinov. He had wasted no time in obtaining clearance to re-exhume the remains. As much as he hated to admit it, the voice had been right to a certain degree about his curiosity. This seemed as good a means as any to put that feeling to rest. Eventually the crew succeeded in reaching Pieter's casket. Upon Navarro's order they opened it. Pieter's body was still present and displaying the expected decay of a man buried in 1959. Unfortunately, there was a small piece of paper held tightly within his right hand. One of the crew quietly handed it to Navarro. It contained a single note. Daniel. I knew you wouldn't be able to resist. See you soon. 
J.T.H. Navarro sat down on the edge of the grave. He buried the note in his fist as he gave a nervous laugh. Well, shit.